like to uh, convene the uh, <coughs> Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we do have a uh, quorum present. Um, I would like to announce um, there was a fair amount of uh, publicity that we will be taking up um, today, the uh, marriage amendment, and that is scheduled for this evening. Um, that bill is not in our possession yet. Uh, it will be re-referred uh, from the general orders on the House floor uh, to this committee this afternoon. And so we'll be um, dealing with the uh, marriage amendment this evening. We did get on Friday the uh, fiscal note. So uh, in case anybody's in the audience interested in that particular bill, um, we uh, do have to wait under House rules until we have it technically in our possession. <laughs> Uh, we'll meet one half hour probably after session. We'll announce that. Um, again, it's a little difficult to predict when the uh, session will adjourn, so we'll uh, we'll probably get together one half hour after. Who knows when we'll be meeting a half hour. Okay, we do have, uh, however, this morning uh, two bills that are scheduled. Um, the uh, first one is... Um, House file 863 by uh, Representative uh, Winkler. Welcome back to the committee. You should have gotten on Ways and Means. You're spending a lot of time here anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. It might have been on my list, but for some reason the speaker decided to put me on seven other committees. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's why you have so many bills that are coming here uh, so frequently. Well, to get things started, uh, the chair moves that uh, House File 863, the second engrossment, be recommended to pass and placed on the general register. So if you could, uh, and there are um, no amendments, so if you could explain the, uh, the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, House File 863 is the campaign finance bill. Uh, this is, uh, embodies the set of recommendations from the campaign finance board. It passed out of the State Government Finance Committee last week, I think unanimously, although there m might have been really one really quiet no from somewhere in the room. And this was after the committee adopted an amendment um, related to um, electioneering communications. And um, I didn't support the amendment, but the amendment was adopted and it eliminated, uh, so far as I know, any opposition to the bill. And uh, there is a fiscal note. And Mr. Goldsmith from the Campaign Finance Board has informed me that the uh, $23,000 cost to the state uh, can be absorbed by their agency so long as the uh, state government finance bill appropriation, which is the same in both bodies, is adopted as, as part of the next budget. And for $23,000, I bet they could absorb it anyway. But he doesn't say that. Okay. Any um Discussion, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Winkler. I know during the Rules Committee you had said that, well, I, don't, I won't put anything in your mouth here. Uh, I have a couple of questions about the language. I understand that any fees or um, fines that they place, that it goes to the general fund. Do you know if we have to directly then reimburse them for the fees and fines that they charge, or how does that work? Uh, Mr. Goldsmith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Gary Goldsmith. I'm the Executive Director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. And, and I'm sorry, Representative, I didn't quite hear all the questions. So, Anderson. Well, right now in this bill, as it's written, if you look at Section 11 of the bill, Subdivision 10, it's on page 4, line 6. Um, right here, we're now allowing you to impose statutory civil penalties and issue orders for compliance, and we're also expanding where your um, what you can place fines on. So now you also cover disclaimers if disclaimers were properly made on campaign literature. You also get to put fines in place for expenditure violations, and you also get to put fines in place for any corporate political contributions uh, that are done. So now with that new territory that you will be covering and the ability to impose statutory civil penalties, will you be able to get those fees back, those fines that you charge from the general fund? Is it a, a reimbursement situation, or does it take the act of the legislature to later on come back and either reimburse you for those costs, or that you just have to live with what your budget is for the year? Can you tell me that piece? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Anderson, um, from time to time, uh, people, including legislators, have 
uh, suggested that fines and fees levied by the board be appropriated to the board. The board has always v uh, vigorously opposed that. We don't want any connection between our um, compliance work and our budget. So the budget travels separately. Whatever our budget is, it is, and all fines and fees go into the general fund of the state, and there's no trade-off between them. I also might mention that although the language in the bill says we are allowed to impose fines and civil penalties, actually the board has done that throughout all of its 35-year uh, uh, existence and individual statutes indicate that the board can impose fines and fees but we felt uh, it would be appropriate to put it in the general provision as well. You're correct that there are some new provisions that are brought under the board's jurisdiction but the concept of charging fines and fees uh, is not new. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Goldsmith I'll probably talk to you about those new areas that you will have um, control over under this legislation uh, later. But for Representative Winkler, I also noticed in the bill um, that now if you go to, say, a fundraising event and a hat is passed around, um, it used to be that if you found a $20 bill in the pot, you didn't have to report that. It was basically an anonymous contribution. Now you're raising that level to $50. So you could be at a fundraiser and a person would give you $50 and you don't have to report at all the person's name, their address, and what they're, or anything. Is that correct under this bill? Representative Winkler or Mr. Goldsmith? Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson, that is no. correct. We moved the threshold from $20 to $50. It has not been updated for some time. I would note uh, that the Senate this morning uh, <laughs> removed that change, so they are staying at $20. That's what they adopted in their finance committee before it went to the Senate floor. And, uh, but, you know, I don't have a particular uh, strong, particularly strongly held view one way or the other on moving from 20 to 50 or somewhere in between. So we may end up with the Senate language there. Okay, and Mr. Chair, Representative, Anderson. Representative Winkler, how about the other section? I'm looking at page 13, page 12 and 12 and 13. And in there we've got um, currently if you receive a contribution that's over $100, you have to list a person's name, their address, <laughs> and their occupation. You bump that up to $200 now. So is that the, was that pulled out in the Senate version? Is it your intent then to go that route as well? Or now is it going to be a situation that you as a candidate could accept $200 from an individual and anything below that you're not going to have to report. Representative Winkler. Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson, it's my understanding the Senate did not pull that language out. And this increase in the threshold reflects the overall increase in the spending and contribution limits in the bill. It's roughly proportionate to th those increases. And remember, under current law, we have uh, a cycle by cycle, or I mean year by year, election year and non-election year reporting. Uh, under this bill, we are moving to election cycle reporting. So the whole, for us, for members of the House, the full two-year period will be covered as one uh, unit of time for contributions, expenditures, and reporting. <coughs> so this is a proportionate change to that. And Mr. Chair and Representative, Representative Winkler, and I think I saw this somewhere that we would be reporting in April 14th at one point. Is it, do I have that correct, or did I misread that somewhere along the lines? Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson, no, I, we're not adding additional reporting dates. Okay. And Mr. Chair and Representative <laughs> Winkler, I also noticed in Section 22, you're changing for when the first time you decide to run for office. Under current law, if you accept over $100 in contribution, that triggers you having to actually register with the Campaign Finance Board. You're now bumping that up to $750. So you could be campaigning for some time, getting those $50 contributions that are now not recordable. Um, is that true? Is that, is that, am I reading that correctly? So. Mr. Uh, Goldsmith. Uh, Mr. Chair, ready. Representative. Anderson, yes. To that point and also to the itemization of individual contributions, um, you're correct. You, the threshold for registration would now be raised to $750. By the way, that's the threshold for b beginning to report in a local election. They don't have to do anything till they've raised or spent $750. Um, 
the uh, cost of living since 1993 when contribution limits were put into place uh, is 62 percent. We've applied that to spending limits but never to contribution limits. And so these types of increases in thresholds are intended to uh, somewhat reflect the fact that the value of a dollar isn't the same now as it was. The reason we would want to look at that periodically is because we need to look back at the state's interest in disclosure in the first place, and that is we can get disclosure of money that might influence or unduly influence a candidate. And um, so the board is suggesting that these days $100 or $200 isn't going to unduly influence a candidate. If that's the case, then what is the state's interest in knowing the name, address, and employer of that particular donor? And so the board feels that these changes help improve the constitutional strength of Chapter 10A. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair and Mr. Goldsmith. My concern, though, is is we're not going to really know who is influencing who because we're now we're changing the threshold from 20 bucks to 50 dollars, and we also have a situation where a person could be, you know, running a good campaign because they don't have to file until they've raised 750 dollars. So, you know, I think Minnesota has always been looked to as a state that has had a very strong uh, commitment to transparency in our election system. But quite honestly, when I look at these changes, I think it makes it less transparent as you're raising uh, who you're raising the level of what triggers um, reporting on some of these issue areas. And, and that gives me great concern, especially when we're looking at $200 and you don't have to list a person's name and address. So, I mean, these are some of the concerns that I have with this bill. I certainly will talk to Representative Winkler offline um, uh, as I go through more of the bill. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, if I could just respond. Dan Winkler. Um, the amendment that was adopted in the uh, State Government Finance Committee took out a significant uh, amount of the transparency that was previously required in this bill related to electioneering communications, which are those cards that go out to people that say, um, you know, you know, in the 60 days before the election that say, uh, you know, tell um, Representative Anderson to stand up for her constituents and start raising uh, revenue or something like that, or thank Representative Anderson for her great work stopping uh, job-killing tax increases or whatever the message is. The idea is that you're, you're putting an issue and a name on it, but you're putting it out right before the election. The, bill, the previous version of the bill required that, con that the uh, people who paid for those ads have to be disclosed. When the amendment was adopted, that uh, disclosure requirement was eliminated, and that was a significant hit on transparency. And as we know, the trend in elections is for more and more money to flow through independent third parties rather than through candidates. And what this bill tries to do is rebalance that to some degree by allowing more funds to, throw, to flow through candidates and candidate committees while requiring more, more disclosure and more transparency for independent third party campaigns. So, I take your point about raising these limits, but frankly, you know, a state house campaign uh, that raises or spends seven hundred and fifty dollars is not a campaign. It's just still an idea for a campaign, in my opinion. I mean, you can maybe you can buy some lawn signs or maybe one round of lit, but that's about it. Um, before we uh, take any other uh, questions, um, <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge we do have treats and. Uh, it was Representative Greg Davids who brought them in this morning, so uh, thank you, Representative yeah. Davids. Um, he's a man of his word. We talked about this last <laughs> week, and he said he was going to bring them on Monday, and he did. Now, I'm, I'm curious now, uh, what is the bakery? Well, Mr. The Chairman, one I had is very good. I was a bit of uh, at a disadvantage as the bakeries in my district are closed on Monday, so I had to improvise. Oh. But, uh, I, and I don't forget things when it comes to rolls. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I think I'm in the same category, uh, Representative <laughs> Davis. So, but thank you very much. So I hope everybody and takes some here. Feel free uh, during the meeting. Uh, there are plenty there to uh, get up, uh, members, and uh, grab one of the uh, rolls. So are all members of the House? And I think all members it? of the House. You're referring yeah, to the committee. author that's before us this morning. That sounds good. Um, Representative Mullery. Mr. Chair, first I'll remind the chair that his sweet tooth is not rolls but cake. Uh, <laughs> uh, however, um, Representative Winkler, the reality is that some people are in cities that the major factor in a campaign is the convention. 
the endorsing convention, and 750 covers what most people spend through the entire thing from the beginning of the campaign through the convention. Uh, so I question a lot this raising it to 750 because in many districts that's the end of the real contest. And so you wouldn't you wouldn't know what was going on. What's the purpose of it, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Mullery? I understand the concern, and, and if people feel strongly about it, it's something that we can uh, consider changing. Uh, but I would be more than happy to put your 750 up against another candidate's uh, bigger expenditure, and it can make a real difference in a endorsing convention. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ms. Rep. Simmel, right? Mr. Chair, and, and um, one person spent 8000 for the convention against me, so I do know it happens, but um, not money isn't always the answer. No. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Well, seeing none, then, the uh, Chair uh, renew renews his motion that House File 863, the second engrossment, <coughs> be recommended to pass and placed on the General Register. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. Oh, yes. Thank you, and, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Winkler. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Member will take the roll. <laughs> we have. Um, Representative Davids, uh, being that this is your morning, uh, have you had a chance to look at the um, minutes? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have. They look good. I would move the minutes. Okay, Representative Davids moves the uh, minutes of May 2nd, 2013. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Two, three, Motion yeah. carried. Two, three, um, we now have uh, the uh, bill by Representative Mahoney. And. Uh, Okay. And we just uh, represented Mahoney here, I'm sure aware we did get an updated uh, fiscal note just this morning, and that's what's being handed out uh, currently. So, uh, Representative Mahoney, would you like to make a motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm going to ask the Chair if I'm making the correct uh, uh, motion. Uh, I want, I, I believe we should just take up the Senate file 1234. Um, so do I move to substitute that language or do we just take, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the Senate file uh, to 1234. The second engrossment to be recommended to pass and placed on the general register and then um, you're going to move the House language? No. No. The bills are identical. Uh, the we bills are identical except for one small thing. They need a couple comma of comments. We have to correct. So we can just correct that on the Senate file then, I take it. I believe we can, okay. Mr. Chair. So to get the bill in proper form. Get uh, the bill in proper form. I would like to move. moves the amendment uh, A5. Correct. Um, which is a technical amendment. Uh, so that would insert the uh, comma that we actually talked about the other day. Any discussion on that amendment? Well, Mr. Chair, I think you have to amend the amendment to the Senate file if we're taking up the Senate file. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was written down here. I didn't. Uh, Thank you. That's right. Uh, no. So the uh, Representative Mahoney moves um, that it um, <coughs> an oral amendment to align with Senate file. Um, so Mr. Senate file 1234 mm. to insert the comma. Mr. Colby, or um, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, the formal amendment to the A5 so that it amends the Senate file would be page one, line one, delete HF number 1359 and insert SF number 1234. <laughs> Everybody have that? Okay, any discussion then? 
Just we have to add a couple of commas apparently. Okay, we're all set. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, now we have the um, Senate file before us as amended. Representative Mahoney. Mr. Chair, uh, as you stated earlier, uh, we've gotten a fiscal note on this particular bill. Um, and I believe it was just finished within the last hour or thereabouts. <coughs> it shows uh, it shows a cost to the state uh, in 2014 of 250 uh, 250 in uh, other miscellaneous special revenues, and then in the workers' comp, it shows a $129,000 uh, cost. So um, I'm not entirely sure how I should read this, but maybe staff can go through the fiscal note. And Mr. Chairman and members, uh, Ron Soderberg with House Fiscal. Um, the fiscal note reflects two different uh, costs. One is the cost, uh, if you look at page one, the workers' comp fund. This is uh, with the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, there's a couple of studies called for in the, in a pilot program called for in the bill, and that do uh, dollar amount of those would be 129000 each year, or 129000 in 14. 124,015, and then there would be none ongoing. Uh, and this would be out of the workers' comp fund. The other one is out of the other miscellaneous special revenue fund. This is the Department of Administration. It's uh, 250,000 in the first year, 333,000 in uh, the next two years, and then 357. And this would be out of the uh, miscellaneous revenue fund. This reflects uh, generally a uh, uh, the biggest cost driver on this is that the uh, the policy, the workers' comp uh, policy advisory committee is recommending that uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, qualify for workers' comp for the uh, uh, in cases where it is uh, uh, mentally inflicted as opposed to physically afflicted, which is covered now. And uh, that would be a cost of about 250000 the first year and 333000 the second year. Uh, the fiscal note is based off the experience of California, which recently incorporated the same change in their law. And I believe they're thinking somewhere between 24 and 40 people could potentially draw down uh, either through injury or through uh, full, full disablement of... Uh, under this particular provision, and uh, that's what's driving the cost. Okay, any questions of Mr. Soderberg? Representative Mahoney? Mr. Chair, that's the, uh, the fiscal cost to this particular bill and why it's in front of you. Okay, any uh, discussion? Mr. Chair? Representative Abel. And that very controversial provision was taken out. About codifying that legal opinion, right? The I, court opinion. Mr. Chair, um, there was a piece of policy in here that um, affected how hospitals were compensated, uh, uh, and that has that's the uh, uh, the study that you saw on the workers' comp uh, on the uh, the fiscal note of 129,000, 124,000. That has been removed, and they are going to study that over the next year to see if they can come to a more equitable uh, arrangement. Thank you. There are a couple other things that I suspect will be included in that study, but you know, there's, this is a bill that um, um, had a few people uh, uh, unhappy. But as with any bill, you're never going to get 100% agreement, and uh, the council has heard from legislators and from the constituents that uh, we as legislators serve that they want them to talk more about 
all pieces of this bill. And they will. Okay, Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Mahoney, I want to commend you. I know you're carrying the bill, and this is a, a bill that works in a bipartisan labor and management way, and it's got significant uh, reform in it this year. So thank you for doing that. I know that's been a work in progress through a number of administrations through both parties, and, and thank you and uh, those folks that have worked on it because this is a good bill. I appreciate it. Thank you. Final final comments. I'm just grateful that we could uh, actually put the PTSD in as it was and uh, deals with uh, people with very traumatic injuries and they need to be addressed and and, and hopefully um, healed. Okay, and I should point out that uh, we did have written testimony by uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the Minnesota County's uh, Intergovernmental uh, Trust. That's in your packets. Um, so the chair, Representative um, <clears throat> Mahoney, do you want to? I don't. Okay, I don't see anybody else. So do you want to renew your motion? I would like to renew my motion that Senate File 1234, as amended, be passed passed to the uh, General Register. Okay, the second engrossment as amended. Second engrossment as amended. Register. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, we also have on the agenda this morning the uh, House uh, budget resolution, and I'd like to bring that uh, before the committee. And uh, then the chair moves uh, the CS RES 04 A4 amendment. And uh, I'd like uh, if Mr. Marks uh, could uh, explain the uh, amendment and what we're uh, doing here. And you also should have a uh, handout in your packets, by the way, that uh, shows the uh, House budget resolution and what's uh, on the bottom line at this point in time. So, Mr. Marks. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, the spreadsheet's probably the easiest way to explain the, the change in the re or proposed change in the resolution. The, uh, the number that would change would be the total net spending number. And if you look on the spreadsheet, this is the number that's uh, uh, about two-thirds of the way down the page. Total net spending number would go from 36116972 to 36099026, or a decrease of 17946000 uh, By changing that number and not changing any of the individual targets, the net effect is that the money the funding available for other bills is reduced by that same amount. And uh, uh, you can see then the, the other bills amount would go from 49410000 to 31464. Uh, the little section on the bottom of the page just outlines the other bills spending uh, that, uh, that is assumed in that 31464. Uh, they're all bills that have passed through the committee. Uh, the one that I would note is the that's a little, well, two that are a little unusual. You want? The first one, the WICRA changes in Chapter 15, uh, this is a $56,000 cost that actually was in a bill that never went through any fiscal committees, and the cost wasn't found until a week or so after the bill was signed into law. Uh, we are counting that one, uh, but that was a bill that escaped a bit. And then uh, other bills that passed through the committee, the bottom one on the list, the hospital staffing study, when that bill went through this committee, there was no appropriation, and that was covered in the Health and Human Services bill. Uh, we're counting it here just because the bill is coming back from the Senate for possible concurrence with an appropriation in it, and, and this would allow that to be covered. So, so you can see the dollar amount uh, matches up there with the uh, proposed amount for the other bills category. And that's the bill by Representative Atkins, if I recall. Okay, so that will be covered. Uh, Representative Abler. Oh, thank you. I just have a couple questions. Um, so there's, we've taken away your elective pot of money then, have we, Mr. Chair? Is that, are you broke? Uh, <laughs> almost. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so I've been kind of following. I appreciate you know, that's, that's a good point. Let me comment. Uh, if, and this has happened, if an emergency of some sort were to uh, develop, uh, we could revisit the uh, budget resolution if there was something that we uh, needed to take care of. Um, the, and I only know this through the news. There was some comment about uh, there may be um, 
some need for some state dollars potentially uh, for disaster relief in southern Minnesota because of the snowstorm and the power outages and all of that. Sometimes with those situations we've had to have a state match and uh, if that were to come about uh, we could always adjust the budget resolution to accommodate that. But that's the only thing that I'm aware of that's um, potentially out there and it's not uh, there yet. I asked uh, Mr. Marks if he could check on that uh, for us, but uh, at least as we're standing today, uh, there's not much left on the bottom line other than the uh, bill by Representative Atkins to cover that one. And it's actually so it's a sign of the end of session, Mr. Chair, that if the Ways and Means Chair empties his pockets that we're getting close, so people that's, should take that's, that's part. That's true. <laughs> but keep in mind that the uh, conference committee targets are a separate discussion. <laughs> Right. You know, this only governs the House. Right. And Mr. Chair, I do have a, just a comment about the target. Um, and I think, Mr. Marks, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, should these bills go forward, if the House were to prevail in everything, and this $17.946 million would be, would be on the bottom line at the end of the day, uh, where would that would go to the school shift at the end of the day? Is that correct? Mr. Marks. Mr. Chair, Rep Representative Abler, it would show up as a budget balance until the November forecast. And if it remained at the time of the November forecast or it plus or minus others, then it would go for education shift reduction. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, so, and so actually I just want to remind people, I don't, I didn't vote for your tax bill, but you did. And you're, you, uh, with some hand wringing, uh, bemoaned the fact about your human services target at minus 150, this ended up being at 152.8 minus. And, uh, have been hoping in, in the on the floor and in the con in ways and means. Uh, Chair Huntley, I don't see him here. Um, took money out of some grant programs for long-term care to get a cola for nursing homes. And so I'm just telling the committee here, as you vote for this, you could have bought a point and a half nursing home uh, cola, permanent, uh, with this 18 million dollars, or leave it available for the school shift. Um, just to remind people, my own personal sadness about our budgeting process. We made some terrible decisions that we had to make in 2011, at, at which the uh, Department of Human Services scored the various things as savings or spending. They were they overestimated spending and underestimated savings. Um, so in one program, $20 million we had to reduce that was totally wrong. Um, and so I, that, just to understand the process that we all bemoan, and they didn't do it in bad faith. Um, but this is something you don't have to do. Um, the uh, both the House and Senate have negative targets. Um, if you, uh, I don't know if the committee got this, maybe it's just for the conferees. Um, but the, uh, just to point out um, that the, uh, only the governor uh, in the first two years uh, spends more money than current law in nursing homes, uh, specifically uh, $35,000 off of current law. And he provides a COLA that's imaginary. Uh, the Senate, actually reduced the spending in 2015 from current law, as does the House. The House is, uh, and, but over the, in the second biennium, both the Senate and the House are under having no bill. And so I'm just challenging you on this decision you're going to make, um, and uh, that you're in charge of this place. But this could have been used to some purpose and strengthens the House positions and negotiations to have a, a stronger human service interest. So I'll be voting no. The, uh Representative Abler, uh, when I saw your name on the list, I kind of guessed what your comments might have been. <laughs> and that's why I stress that um, separate targets will be established for the conference committee. The only reason that we had this uh, left on the bottom line was that the uh, pension bill came in uh, significantly below what um, we thought it might be when we originally passed the uh, budget resolution. I think we had set that uh, potentially at something like $42 million. And uh, Mr. Marks is nodding yes. And uh, it actually came in at what, about 27 or 28, I'm trying to remember. So that's, that's where the money uh, came from, uh, pensions being a lower number. But uh, being that the Health and Human Services Bill has passed, you know, those the negotiations relative to what the ultimate target will be are going to be at the conference committee level now and not uh, based on the House budget resolution any longer. Uh, Mr. Marks has something that he wanted to correct uh, from his earlier statement, I guess. Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Representative Abler, I guess, actually, you asked what would happen under the House proposals. Under the House proposals, the shift, the education shifts would be paid off 
this balance would go to reduce the income tax surcharge. Oh, is that right? uh, no. Mixing paradigms here. <laughs> Mr. Chair. I should never second guess Mr. Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he gives us pretty solid information. I think both sides of the aisle understand that. Oh, yeah. uh, Representative Holberg, you're next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And so what is left on the bottom line after this resolution? Mr. Marks. Mr. Chair, Representative Holberg, there would be the $17.9 million here. The, I believe the jobs bill was uh, about $1 million under target after the amendments on the House floor. And I believe the commerce portion of that is a couple hundred thousand that was under its target. So it would be roughly 20 million. All right, thank you. M Mr. Chair, uh, it, <laughs> under, the, under the budget resolution, it's not available. Relative to total spending and total revenue, it's available. Okay, just to clarify that. Mr. Chair. Representative Just to try to recover from Mr. Marks's uh, <laughs> pointing out a gap in my rationale. Uh, as, we, as we're in conference now and they're negotiating targets in the next several days, I'm sure you're part of that discussion. I'm just trying to cheer for house momentum on this area that we all say is so important to us. So if you vote no on this and then just change, put out a bill, you could show momentum. I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, Representative Holberg, were you done? Well, um, Mr. Chair, then I'm just wondering with the fiscal note on the bill after mm -hmm. session, are you taking that from the bottom line or how are you paying for that? The, uh, well, well, we'll have, um, to clarify everything there, uh, MNB is going to be testifying uh, tonight uh, on the fiscal note, but uh, the, um, as I understand it, the, um, Health insurance part of it will be absorbed by the agencies, and the um, marriage license uh, part of it uh, generates 190,000 in increased uh, revenue. So the health insurance, such a huge base that that will simply be absorbed. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, further discussion on the resolution? Okay, then the chair renews his motion that the uh, CS-RESO4-4A amendment uh, to the House Budget Resolution uh, be passed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. With that, uh, we will be in recess, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will... Um, Convene about a half an hour after um, the uh, House adjourns. So that could be late afternoon, evening, not sure. With that, we're in recess. So.